So it's, it's fantastic to introduce Hernan. Hernan has been out for the, uh, as the design Baumer uh, this year. We did Sylvia Leib in, in the fall, and so we're trying to work to, towards a theorist and a designer each year on the semester system. So he came out, and you know, the idea was to let, get some ideas in the air early and then let, uh, bring, a, bring an architect in and let them show how they work through a project, how they uh, carry ideas from project to project to project. And as far as I was concerned, there is no one better. There is no, there's only a few architects I know of who, whose body of work adds up to a coherent set of development with, with a integrity and intensity um, that uh, match her nons. And it would be some people, very few people, Greg Lynn, Frank Gehry, Peter Eisenman. Um, it's not that there's a lot, not a lot of great architects and not a lot of uh, Tom May, but, but there's a certain kind of intensity that you'll see tonight. And I'm really looking forward to um, hearing what he has to say and having you hear what he has to say. Hernan and I go way back. He was uh, in a couple of classes I taught at Columbia a long time ago. Um, of all the students I've ever taught, he's turned into the colleague that I've learned the most from. Um, and there are occasions that all teachers have that at a certain point in time, roles will reverse with certain students. And now I think he's a much more important teacher for me than I am for him. Uh, we have him at a really good time. He's uh, just been named the Emerging Architect of the Year by Architecture Review Magazine in London. He was named the... Uh, or is about to be named the, the chief curator or the commissioner of the first uh, Barcelona International Architecture Biennale, which will open next year, and uh, won a PA Design Award. But I think the credential I think is the most impressive is, uh, I think how, when did you take over the graduate program? Um, okay, so like three or four years ago, if you looked up SciArc uh, and you looked their rankings up, um, you know, everyone knows SciArc, everyone respects SciArc, but you never saw SciArc ranked among architecture schools uh, in any of the ranking polls. And last year, the graduate program at SciArc, which uh, Hernan is the graduate director, and before that, he was the thesis, graduate thesis director. Uh, last year, it was named the number one graduate program in the country. And so I think he's a, he's a kind of force of architect. I know, I know there's a U.S. News and World's Report. I know there's other ranking ones, but there's, this was uh, the report from the uh, Jeff Kipnis Favorite Schools of Architecture website. <laughs> <laughs> and he won. <laughs> I, I forgot what the website was, but uh, it, was a, it was a good one. So uh, I think you'll find the work, um, whether you like the work or not, it will mesmerize you with its technique, its uh, vision, the clarity of its thinking, its aesthetic, um, it's, it's really something to see. So, it's uh, my great honor to introduce a, a real colleague and a, a great pleasure to introduce a close friend, Hernan Alonso Diaz Alonso. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, good, okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, that's so pretty kind words. It means a lot to me coming from Jeff. I'm here just to promote Jeff's show on Friday. Um, this whole three years is only that. Um, um, it, it really has been uh, intense three days. Uh, I think I'm in three times in a semester would be way better, even though this was much more practical, because it forced me for three days to try to say different things. If I wouldn't come every month and a half, I can repeat myself, they would not remember. Um, so, but this is, uh, it has been a pleasure. It, this is a fantastic school that we always admire, and to have my name add to those such a distinguished list that precede me, uh, you guys are going down with the quality. Uh, I, ho I hope the next year you pick it up again. Um, and on that note, uh, let's see, can we turn off all the lights so people can sleep? Um, it's so nice with the snow outside to take a good nap. Um, how we, lighting control. Ah, I can control it from here. All off. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Can we turn off this too? Um, this is bothering me. There we go. 
Um, so what I, what I thought, uh, I think the last time I lectured here was, I don't know, 2005 or something like that. Um, so it has been a long time. So I decide to go with, um, I, I do three kind of lectures. Is one, is, it's always one hour, no matter what. Um, but the one is, uh, I show not that many images in one hour, now I show so-so, and the one I show a lot. This one is the one I show a lot. Um, so that's usually useful because you tend to forget what I say. Uh, and, and that is always a useful thing. So uh, the, the title I came for the lecture for this year is Form and Gloom. Um, it really doesn't matter right now. We'll focus later. But let me show you a clip that I think illustrates very well my approach to architecture. You know, I don't want there to be any hard feelings between us, Harvey. When you and uh, Rachel, Rachel! Rachel were being abducted, I was sitting in Gordon's cage. You know, I, I didn't rig those charges. Your man, your plan. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? You know what I am? I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. You know, I just do things. I love that. I mean, I love the idea that, um, because I think most of architects are the, like the joker. We all like to think that we don't know what we're doing, that we're trying to figure it out, and so on and so forth. Um, but most often than not, you have usually some kind of an evil plan to take over the world secretly. Now, like the joker, you're a little bit delusional. You're not going to really do it. So you're chasing cars. But at the end of the day, you just do stuff. And I am a strong believer in the notion of do stuff. Do first, think after. I know that that's not the right thing to say in a school. Um, but it's really what I believe is the best approach to architecture. Now, when I'm gonna, uh, the roller coaster I'm going to try to take you over roughly 11 years of work is it try to achieve and relate to all these issues. Um, ultimately, the most important one, in, in a way, these are not ranked, but I will say the cinematic and the cinematic effects with the ambition to produce desire always has been on the forefront of my um, intentions as an architect. This has to do with a very old desire to be really a filmmaker and not an architect. And if for a long story, I ended being an architect, and I'm totally fine with that. But there's always something in the back of my head that try to go back to that again and again. The other one is I believe that forms, forms follow form. I don't believe in form following function. Um, first, probably because I cannot pronounce function very well, uh, and, and I, that I think form 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 is easier. But I really believe that the true quality over the times and what makes architecture mem memorable or um, worth doing, it has to do with the quality of form. And the other one I would say that is absolutely crucial, and I will say all the, the projects that I work and that we work in the office, and I'm going to show you. They relate one way or another with the condition of the grotesque and the horrific as uh, alternative mechanism for the production of beauty. Now, the other one, which I think is absolutely crucial in whatever small contribution I think I'm doing to the field, it has to do with the notion of the image of the vehicle for the production of form inst instead of geometry for the production of form. Even though we produce a lot of geometrical, geometrical work and so on, I would argue that the image is the most important thing for, uh, for me. The other one, which I think is interesting, I think most of the world trying to rely on the idea or to rethink the idea of editing as a way to replace composition. And the last two are, one is my obsession with virtuosity. And I would argue that the work relies on those obsessions again and again and again. And at that, I would, I would say also that virtuosity to me is a way to rethink the notion of close reading. And also virtuosity is a possibility for a mechanism to replace the notion of manifesto. And last, but not least, the notion of lust and arousal to try to be a little bit more precise about the condition of affect. Now, it's clear to me that also the kind of practice that I, I, that I do, which is what I would call a speculative practice, is set in a multiple legs. And all of them are, in a strange way, weak by themselves. But I would argue that together produce something that some sort of a coherence. One is all the work that we produce is, in, in, is intricate. Uh, intrinsically related to what I do as a teacher or now as a program head at the school, at a school of SciArc, 
it has been incredibly influential. I cannot conceive the notion of practice without the con with, the, with the sense of teaching and the sense of um, investigation that can through teaching. The other one, it has to deal with the, the possibilities of emerging mediums and the flirtation of architecture with art in the last 30 years that are, allows us the possibility for completely different territory. And the third one, it has to do with a much more classical way to understand the notion of practice, that even though we don't do it, we always have try to aspire to have it. Now, as we said, the, 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 the basis of the work is actually are fairly simple. I will not argue that the work is simple by any means, but I would argue that the basis, the basis and the desire that drives the original thinking in the work are fairly simple. And it has to do with certain sense of understanding of disciplinary knowledge, which I find incredibly important. I think you need to understand that so you can violate those rules that, in a way, determine the field that you operate. So the work of Francis Bacon, for me, is highly important, not only for obvious aesthetic reasons, but also because I consider, a I consider him a painting that is highly disciplinary. So his techniques of painting and so on, that they didn't have anything innovative. He was not like somebody like Picasso or somebody like Duchamp, that there was a before and after in art. It's much more a, continui a continuity of a tradition of portrait painting and so on. So that fascinates me in many aspects. The other one it has to do with the, 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 the negotiation between conventions of information of unconventional elements. And this is how to lay out the croissant um, by Enrique Mirajek, which I always find incredibly compelling. I always think go to go back. And then there are always a sense of urgency on, on obsessions about the now. Uh, and this is something I've been talking with the students for the last three days. I have always have a sense of obsession to try to understand what is the now, what is the culture of the present, what, what is the factors of the present, that, what are the agencies of contamination that we can use in terms of the work. And the reason why I'm interested in the now is because I'm absolutely convinced that architecture as a cultural practice can only exist in the now. We are bound and we are pressured by the past, uh, which is kind of a bitch in architecture, but at the same time, we always try to produce a project and try to pr anticipate the future, but that future never turns out in the way they're trying to anticipate. So focusing on the now seems a much more relaxing, le relaxing thing to do, to say the least. So anyway, I'm going to try to show you a huge amount of projects and a huge amount of images basically organized in six episodes. Uh, the first episode is a single surface, and this is what I will call it the face of the world where the world was experimental. We tend to use experiments and research and interchange of words, and they're not. For my, for my money, experiments is when you don't have a clear sense of what you're doing. You're trying to figure it out, you learn a couple of techniques, you pick a couple of tricks along the way, then eventually that you start to figure out certain elements, so that things start to become a repertoire. And if you're lucky, and you're smart enough, and you work hard, that starts to become a sensibility. And at some moment, that becomes a process. Now, at the beginning, the single, the single surface trying to do everything was highly experimental. Now, and on the way, you bump into things that are useful. So when we did this competition for the U2 Tower, uh, somebody in an article ma mentioned that there was a grotesque emerging aesthetic coming out of the computer, which I thought was a really interesting idea. Now, grotesque, we tend to associate too much with something disgusting or ugly and so on, but actually grotesque is when any aesthetic paradigm doesn't fit with the paradigms on any given time. So looking at the work of Damien Hears and so on, that became a different way to start to think about the problem. So OK, the, the idea we can start to build an agenda. I'm, I'm a formalist. I'm interested in form, form follow forms. Ergo is about aesthetics. If it's a problem of aesthetics, what are the paradigms? What are the qualities that we need to think in contemporary terms to relate to it? And grotesque seemed to be an interesting thing. Now, the problem with, with it is grotesque is an emerging quality. You cannot control it. The grotesque quality is something that emanates. You cannot manipulate. So the sense of the horrific or the narrative of the horrific, it became an interesting tool because it's something that you can choreograph. And there is a lot of similarities into the horrific emotion with emotion in relation to beauty. So that's one aspect in terms of aesthetic aspiration. Now, in terms of instrument, and I, I, I will be the first one to argue, that the evolution of my own work it has been a partnership and relation with the evolution of techniques and technology. I'm absolutely committed to the use of computational tools. Our, our office, we don't sketch, we don't do much physical models. Everything is produced with these things. Now, a couple of things when the work started to move from experimenting to research, we start to make it into process, and eventually it became a discourse, potentially, or an agenda, is you start to charge the thing with intentionality. 
So when we did the, the competition for PS1, this is what we showed to the, to the jury. It was the first time that we started to use animation, the camera movement, not as a way just to present the project, but as a way to design it and a way to think it. So the idea to start to produce cinematic effects out of architecture. So we were using a lot of borrowing elements. This had a lot to do with Alien or Ridley Scott, in which you can never see the monster. You see it partially. I was also joking, half joke, half serious, that this project was related to porn in the 70s because porn and Simmons was trying to pretend to be a real movie, but it was not a real movie because it was shown in theater. And then VCR came and fast forward kill it because people fast forward to sex. So the tradition of the good high quality porn was gone. So, but my argument was that the, with the computational world was coming also pseudo-scientific neo-rational argument and I didn't feel comfortable with it. The reason why I was talking with porn is because porn was an excuse to film about sex, but they were trying to make a whole bad act in it. So my sense was there was a lot of computational work that was really about the pure new conditions of form that everybody was trying to attach to some kind of mathematical scientific argument that it was not really related to it, but there was some other aesthetic possibility. So it happens that we won PS1. Um, and the other thing that was interesting about that is when we, when, when, when we finished the piece, and I sent a picture to a couple of friends. A couple of them thought there was a montage. There's a cool Photoshop. And that was interesting to me because that opened another series of interests in me, which was the notion that the reality is tried to imitate artificiality and not the other way around. So the desire is not that the render tried to produce how the building is going to look in reality, but how the real thing can look like a render. And to me, all the things are discoveries, as, as was, I've been discussing for the last couple of days, I'm a strong believer in the notion of autopsy. If you if you if you already been listening to what I'm telling you is that like the discovery happening in producing the project. So and in discovering those things it became some sort of an ethos to start to work on it. So some of these elements were happening by those by those by those discoveries. So the whole notion of cinematic effect was an interesting way for me to start to marry certain certain desires to work in films and also how that can relate to architecture and the idea of mutation and permanent start of transformation is something that o I always interests me since ever. So these little guys that were fabricated in LA, this was all con old school sculpture with uh, a structure with fabric, but these things were fabricated in LA. And when we talked to New York, we accelerated the process, long story, but basically start to develop pimples and bubbles. And and, and Nikolai Urosov, which at the time was a New York Times critic, he thought that it was on purpose because I was into the grotesque and the horrific. Uh, and of course, I said, of course, we did it totally on purpose, but it wasn't. But what was interesting about that was the idea of the complete instability. And then also start to trigger a different series to start to understand how you can negotiate the tradition of the discipline with pos new possibilities to how to operate. operate. Now, a species versus type, to me, it's an interesting way to start to think about how to avoid typology, because the other thing that was emanating all this kind of work, it didn't quite fit in any kind of recognizable kind of type. So if you start to think in terms of a species, or what Jeff would call genres, you can start to relate projects with each other that are not necessarily related to the same type. So a proposal for a park in Boston can relate to a small solo show installation piece in SF MoMA in the sense of even though they, do, they belong to completely different types of problems of architecture, at the species level, at the cellular level, at the unit level, it start to operate in a, in, 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 a, in a similar frequency. And what was interesting about these two is, if you look in PS1 or the other one, we were working with cellular variation and repetition. Because for a while we were working on small projects, then we start to figure out to work on bigger projects. So the idea to incremental variation with continuity is something that always interests me. I've always been interested in disruption and fragmented, but at the same time there was a desire to produce a new coherency. So in any case, when we did the show on SF MoMA, the idea was to refuse to have any sense of pedagogical show. So we had a series of cells or genetic codes that we call it, that they were the origin of different species within the work of the office. And then you will go to a series of animation that will show that evolution, and then you will work into this, it will work into this big piece that we call it sangre, that in this case the, pump, the, uh, the, the pimples and the bubble we did it on purpose. We were interested in that and think we keep changing over time in, in, in the show. Um, so again, 
we don't get to do many buildings on it, uh, stuff like that. So when we have shows, we always try to convince the curators to let us build something and to try to, re to rethink about that. So that show that we did in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, then it got re reassembled and in a different way in the Art Institute in Chicago. And then, okay, so until then, I would argue that the work was fairly naive uh, and fairly kind of, we, we make it as we go by. But then the, the autopsies and the mechanisms start to become a much, a, a something much more specific. So we, we start to do competitions again. We start to go after, not, not that we were going to after to win them, but we, was, we were going back to rethink architecture on a bigger scale, think more into an architectural problems. So we, we were not doing um, that many installations for a while. So we, would, we did a competition for a library in, in, <coughs> in Sweden. And then we got invited to do a guest house for Natalie Seruzzi, which is an art collector in France. So the other thing is that, so in parallel, there is a discourse and argument that you're building. But at the same time, when you're working in the office, you tend not, at least I tend not to focus too much on that. I tend to focus much more in the day-by-day -day operation, how you, how you think about these elements. So and how you start to develop a method. So the office, uh, until PS1, it was me and one, one or two guys. By now. Is a, is a bigger group, so you start to rethink also how you communicate and how you discuss with the team. So instead to have one singular cell or one singular unit that transform and mutate and produce variation like in PS1, we start to codify the world with multiple cells of the origin. So we start to as assign certain pre-values, one that will relate more with structure, that some of them will relate more with, em with envelope, and in that configuration give us the opportunity to produce families. So I've always been a strong believer in the notion of species and family. So ev at any given time in the office, we always work, try to work in three or four projects at the same time around a series of similar genetic codes or uh, similar species. Now, the question is also how you start to incorporate agencies, uh, agents of mutation or agencies of contaminations or agents of dirtiness, if you will. So I would say that the project until even, even in, in the, uh, at this time, the, pr the work is still, the project with capital P, is still is a very pure one. It still is a very clinical, self-contained, not so open. And, and if you look, most of the renders and most of the animation, they're always floating in black background. There is a desire to cancel that, to produce a quasi science fiction quality. But through this project, we start to go back to drawings and start to rethink about assembly and to start to think about certain problems of not only representation, but certain problems of assembly and start to rethink um, the work. So. In parallel to that, again, multiple scales, the one of the things that fascinates me the most, the most about computers is the possibility of a fake sense of a scaleness, of that is a scaleless. It's not true. You, you always somehow think in the scale. But there's a certain quality that fascinates me, which is certain formal principles or certain aesthetic, horrific, grotesque quality that you're working on that can be translated from a library to a house to a small object that it will accumulate to produce an exhibition. So when Peter Nover, the director of the former director of the Max Center, asked me to do a solo show, um, my ambition was uh, once again not to do a project in which, uh, not to do an exhibition in which we show models and drawings, but was much more to do uh, an exhibition about capture a certain sense of what the work was. So in this case, unlike PS1, in which we're using cinematic and uh, animation as a way to produce a formal language. In this case, we wanted the exhibition, the physical entity, to become like, like a movie, like an animation, like you will feel like you are in, a, in an animated sequence. So the other thing that we learned is, unlike in PS1, in which all the structural pieces were all different, there was almost 1,500 different pieces, in this case, it's always the same, but we just tweak a little bit the legs. It makes the fact that they're all different. So you learn a couple of things along the way that doing all the pieces different is kind of the stupid thing to do in, in, in your life. And that's, I, I will concede, is the only thing I think the minimalists got right, is the idea of clarity, how to maximize things. Um, but what was interesting to me about this, what it was also discovery about this, was that at that time we were seriously flir flirting with art, and we were, and basically the, the, the reason why I was I'm being fascinated with art is not because I think art is more interesting than architecture, it's because you make more money out of art than you make out of ar architecture. So I was trying to figure out that we can have a double career. So, but what was interesting about, and by the way, this, this show proved that too, but I'll tell you in a second. 
But what was interesting is despite my best effort to be an artist, First of all, the artists don't accept me in their community, and the architects don't accept me in their community. So the architects keep kicking me out, go and be with the artists, and the artists keep kicking me back, go back with the architects. But the thing is, what is interesting is, despite my best effort, even though these things I will relate to product design or art scale objects, they are thought as an architect. They are pieces of architecture, despite my best effort. Because you can do this thing out of one piece, but it's made out of four. And we look, we think how we're going to assemble, how we're going to put it together. So at the end of the day, <coughs> each of these exhibitions became some sort of a laboratory and platform to figure it out, architecture ideas, and how your people are going to move around. So despite your best effort, if you're an architect, you are an architect. Now, the cool thing about it is we did a little bit of money with the Mac, but we sold four of them to Francesca and Hasbro as art. And trust me, you make way more money as an artist than as an architect. So if you can find a way to do that, go for it. Um, in any case, um, so in relation to that, when we were doing the mag and so on, the other thing which was interesting, like in, in a strange way, um, Jeff was talking about the coherency of the, of the coherency of the work, and I think the work is highly coherent, and I think it had to do also because it worked by a group of families, so each of these projects I, sh I show you at any given time, there are four or five that are done at the same time. So there's a lot of common vocabulary that move from one to the other one. I always joke about this, but it's true. I'm a strong believer in intellectual laziness. There is something interesting about having one or two ideas only and exhaust them to the point that there's nothing left you can do with them. I, I, really, I, really, I really find that incredibly appealing. So to me, the notion of the mutation, the notion of transformation, then suddenly ornament start to become something that it became part of the argument. But it was not really important, but I, I don't have an interest in ornament per se. It was a kind of an obsession of how much we can contaminate, how much we can distort, how much, how horrific operations we can do. So we start to look in cancers, skin cancer, blistering, um, um, gangrena, all kind of things that can mutate the transformation of the skin to start to apply to the thing. So it's, a, it, it, it was a, it's an interesting period in that sense. So. One of the things with the argue that is completely, completely innovative, and I would say is one of the most powerful things that the computer brought to the table, uh, this is a, it's called the chess, the chess grotesque. Basically, we took the Ames chairs and we, st we, we infected with the virus, and it started to produce all this transformation, and we did it for the artists in Chicago, but it, it, that's not the point. One of the things that I find the most compelling argument about uh, computers is that it has an extraordinary capacity to negotiate, to negotiate contradictory arguments. And that's something that interests me big time. And I realized after a while that that's what I've been working all my life as an architect. The idea how you negotiate something that there was incredibly contradictory arguments, how you, how you operate, how, how you establish the paradigm of modernism of Corbusier, which I always find interesting with the kind of Rococo sensibility. And the com for me, the computer had that capacity. Because he had the capacity to produce a lot of differentiation, a lot of mutation, a lot of distortion, but at the same time, he had the capacity to make it very coherent. So he will not produce any collage effect, or, or it can produce multiple ontology, which I think is a very interesting problem, but I will argue it's not exactly what I work. What I, work, what I will think I work is in a strange way, in, in coherent, coherent contradictions. And the reason I say by this is because I think if you think at the beginning of the 19th century when Romanticism opposed German rationalism, which I said yesterday to, some, uh, to the students or the day before, which is always a good thing to oppose Germans in general, but the idea that you oppose German rationalism is a great idea, and, and, but also the Romanticism was an extraordinary one. But today you can negotiate and have both. So you can have a romantic sensibility, a romantic, a romantic uh, formal effect that is, in di is a direct byproduct of a highly rational process of uh, methodology. And this is the part, for example, that I disagree deeply with Patrick Schumacher, the idea that everything needs to be highly rational. Now, at the same time, I'm not arguing for gesture, because I think romanticism was, for example, in this incredibly sophisticated apparatus of process, too. It's not, like, it's not that one, I, one I'm talking about. But what I'm talking is the possibility of contradictory arguments producing no coherency. Um, I think, I mean, we can talk about that that could be new subjectivities. I never feel comfortable with the, of, uh, with the, with the notion of subjectivity, neither I, I feel comfortable with phenomenology. If somebody told me, 
your work has a phenomenal thing, I feel incredibly insulted. Um, because it, it, I don't really have a good argument for it. It's just I was educated in, in, in a hardcore modern thing that everything that was postmodernism is bad. So if somebody said that's postmodernism, I automatically think it's bad. And phenomenology also, I was educated to think that it was very bad. It means watercolors and things like that that I find all of them repulsive. So it's not really have a rational argument why phenomenology is bad. It just sounds bad. The word, I think, is wrong. I think that the word that represents it is, is wrong. The kind, of the kind of drawings and architecture that come out of it is wrong. So I really try to think about that they work in different terms. I think the work has, uh, that's one thing, the horrific seems like an interesting idea because I think the romantic, the romantic quality, it, it relates to that. But I would argue also that ultimately the excessive and exuberant quality in the project does, I think it deals with other qualities. I think the work is way too literal and the work is way too in your face to relate with any kind of sense of emotional thing. Even though I, I, one could argue that the work has that, I like to think that the work is not like that. And that's, for example, one of the things that fascinates me about people like Francis Bacon or, or Damien Hirst or Christopher Nolan as a filmmaker, that the work seems incredibly, it, it seems the work of an author. It seems a work that is tailored by authorship, but at the same time it has a huge distance they produce like a kind of a highly analytical way to think about the problem. So also I'm very aware that the work is, is very introverted in a way, that the, the, the logic is an internal one. And I, and I, I don't make the case, and this is, this is important. I just telling you the way I work, and I'm not even saying that these are my, my truth. This, this is the way I work, and this is the thing that interests me and how I operate. By any means, I think, by no means, I think that what I do is the right way to do it and everybody's wrong. What I'm doing, is, I think, is just contribute to a larger discussion. I always joke that my work is like salt. It's, it's not so nice to eat food without salt, but it's way worse to eat just salt. So I'm aware of all those things. I will not advocate. Uh, I will think, don't get me wrong, if, if they offer me to do a big master plan and sit in China, I'll do it in a second, but I think it would be a bad idea. Um, <laughs> Um, but I'm accustomed to do things that are bad ideas. So in any case, uh, the, w this project was uh, the Tabacalera, the, the competition was important because when we got invited to do the, the, the exhibition for the John Loner, the, 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 the invite four architects and each of us, we got the John Loner house and we need to add a 30% and we had a 13% of evil. And it's a long story. It came up here, Pierce and James Bond movie and Charlie Angels and it's always the house of the bad guys. So we had 30%. But what it was interesting was and that's why we start with the contradictory and the negotiation of, of the misfits, which was we start to use platonic geometry with highly known platonic geometries, and, uh, and we, uh, we did that in this project. And the other thing is we start to work with existing tissues, so start to produce a much more frictional work. And if you notice, the renders are not anymore just floating in the background, and they are not single objects, so the autonomy of form is not just autonomy of form as an object in the computer, it's also is right now is, is trying to produce a friction, trying to produce a di dialogue, is trying to put negotiation between these contradictions. This is another competition that we did for a museum in Warsaw. Um, so, now we're getting close to what I really want to talk today to you guys, which is the, the work of the last three or four years in the office, which is where we are still now, which is episode five and six. The episode five starts with the notion of rituals. What it became interesting about, again, I, I will argue not just me, I think it is a lot of people who've been working in, in this genre and, and, and in this kind of work, and I think everybody's looking for different possibilities of contamination. I think everybody's looking for different mechanisms that allows us to break the hermetic quality that emanates from computational process. I think everybody's looking to produce new, uh, new strategies of humanism. To, re to reivindicate the notion of, of humanism. Um, and mine was, one was just to start to look in the notion of rituals. I think rituals for me were fascinating when you look in the bullfighting because in one way there is a very primal, brutal thing, killing a bull. At the same time there is a super ornament dress and tools that goes into it. So there is a kind of a collapse in between a highly refined series of elements to produce an incredibly violent act. And to me that was, in a way, already what we were doing, but this was a way to start to add to that discourse and start to add to that agenda. 
in the sense of, I think for a long time, and I think to me that ultimately are the most luxurious and exuberant forms of beauty. The one that they are always on the edge in something that is incredibly dangerous and, and incredibly precise. But at the same time, that it produce, it has to pro it produce conflicted emotion, conflicted reaction. So, and I, I, I like to think that our work always has been operating in, in those terms. So to me, the notion of ritual is not an evocative thing, it's not a metaphorical thing, it's an instrumental thing. The same way, and I think it adds to the repertoire of the grotesque and the horrific. I think it relates to those qualities and it allows us to produce mechanisms that introduce a possibility to give a, the, the work a, a different kind of a coherency. I would argue that the work is highly coherent, and I think I, I would like to argue, I, I, I would argue that the project always produced some sort of um, elegance is not a word, but a, se a sense of um, wholeness that is difficult to avoid. As much as I'm interested in imperfect edges and imperfection, the project always go back to a sense of harmony and, and even in, in the old convoluted thing. So I, I really think it's absolutely crucial to work with obsessions and the way that you operate in the sense of, I think the agenda of your work, you have to sell, set impossible goals. Meaning, I think it's absolutely impossible to produce imperfect edges, let's say, in, in form generated by computer. But I think it's a very healthy thing to have the ambition to do that. I think it's impossible to produce uh, an architecture that produces social behavior modification to the stream. But it's, it's, a good, it's a good sense to try to do that. I think it's impossible to produce architecture that is truly new, but I think it's good that you go for it. And the same goes with originality. I think it's impossible to achieve true originality in architecture, but I, I, I think it's ethically an obligation to go for it. And I think all these, at the end of the day, are mechanisms and ways to start to operate within that. So um, when Alessi asked us to develop two collections two different years, the, the problem of species and gender mutation became an interesting one because we needed to work with instruments that they had to fun function at the basic level. In this case, it's a bottle tap, uh, a, screw, uh, a silverware. But it was interesting is this kind of thing is not a highly formal, but if you, the, if you will have to eat with this first, we wanted to produce elements that they were danger, dangerous, that you will feel threaded by trying to use it. And to me, it has to do with another aspect, which I like a lot, which is to bring day by day playful things into the, into the mix. So when I was a kid, in my house, and my father collects stuff, so there was always this great silver one and so on that we couldn't touch. We couldn't use it. Because, so I like the idea to produce these objects that they were luxurious and dangerous, and you shouldn't touch it. So I, I like to produce objects that kids would feel f f afraid to touch it. But then I if you use it, it will change the way that you po that you're posturing your body in the table. So I like... I like the notion of extreme formalism that have the capacity to produce <laughs> um, change of behaviors. Now, of course, these are all interesting ideas. It really doesn't matter because this kind of thing for Alessi is not like they're done for people to buy it and to use it. They're, they're, doing, they're, done, they're done with ambition and the people will buy it to collect them. So it's kind of a fake operation of functionality, but nevertheless, uh, fake is good. Um, so anyway, uh, we did a tray, an ashtray, cigar cutter. Uh, a, year, a year and a half later, we did a new collection, and then we got into travel because um, um, product design is, is, is an interesting territory. I, I, I really have problems with it because I don't have enough space to do stuff. It's not enough. We cannot put enough stuff in it. So we, I wanted to do this chandelier in which the, the wax will become part of the project. So when things will start to melt, it will become part of the thing. And, and of course, they did a focus group, and all the people hated it. Uh, and, and because Alessi loved this one, loved the previous collection, right? They love it. But it was too expensive to fabricate the tools and so on. So they said, can you simplify it? And instead of simplify, we did a completely different collection, which I like it much more. But the problem with product design, I thought when we started to do it, that they would have an immediacy that it was pretty cool. Actually, it's the worst. It, it, it takes as long as to do an architecture. It's a pain in the ass. Um, but you, you get to speculate about certain things with the bottle opener, uh, paperweight. And they're doing this thing. This is the, the only one they're doing right now. Um, so we did also uh, a display system for that for an exhibition. Um, and out of all those speculations, the notion of romanticism, um, a couple of things that I, is I, I, I want to mention. One is I'm really interested in literality. I, I don't know if that became evident but now. But I'm, I'm obsessed with the notion of literal effects. So if we're looking into flowers, I'm interested in, okay, we're going to use flowers. 
or we're going to use cauliflower, or, or whatever it is, I'm interested in literality. So the, the Mac in LA asked us to do a simple installation. And it was a very, very small budget, and, but it was like a guerrilla operation. We had three days to do it. So we took the money that we have. We went to the flower market in, LA, in, L in Los Angeles, and we bought all the money that we have in flowers. And I hired a couple of old, wonderful Mexican ladies that they, they do all the cemetery crowns. And they know how to do structure out of flowers. Uh, and then we bought a bunch of these balls and we put a series of monitors and animations. And the show is supposed to be, to be two, two months in the summer in one of the garages. So the idea is at the, at the end of the day, the whole show will collapse. I mean, because the whole structure will fall apart, the, 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 this, this thing will break, and so on. The problem is it, ne it never collapsed. Um, it, it just got dry, it smelled like shit, sorry. Um, I forgot we, we are in the Midwest. It's made, it smells very bad. Um, and, but what was interesting it was the capacity, how it, it completely changed uh, the mood of, of the operation because of the change of the color and the change of the smell and the change of the presence of it. But the other thing which was interesting, that the, the, the thing with the flower and the romantic thing, and of course at the time I was looking a lot into Alexander McQueen uh, and people who were flirting with that neo-romanticism and so on, as I was watching a lot of Duran Duran videos from the 80s, uh, which are awesome. Um, but the other thing which was interesting about flowers is flower became a really good mechanism for me to replace my lack of capacity to have any idea about color. So, but also the notion of the mutation, the mutants, the, the transformation, the gore, the flower was really interesting because it would allow us to have to produce projects that had the capacity to change color and behavior over time. So the idea to something that we were working on speculating as a structure of animation, it can take a life in, in material effect. So uh, Francesca von Hasborn, the Thyssen Bornavisan Museum Collection in Vienna, commissioned us in a small museum pavilion in Patagonia. She wanted to have three small museums in the world and she, tr she would move her collection around. Francois Roche got one, he already got fired. Um, I got the second one. I haven't been fired yet, but the project is has stopped. But we won the PA award, not with this version, but with the other version. So we make the PA award and get us back in the game with it. But what was interesting about this, this was really about to think of the cellular notion of the, the genre and the species quality. So each of these little, the little rooms can be built separate. So potentially the project can start to organize. But also, we did all the highly ornamented element outside, the, this part here. Um, this part here, uh, as a sculpture, uh, then if the rest of the building doesn't happen, at least we can put it up. And we use this kind of ornament and all these other elements as a way to grow plants and change of colors. It doesn't want in Patagonia, in the summer the building will be incredibly colorful, in the winter it will be completely dry and depressing. Um, so there was that sense of element that I was really interested in, and in a way the landscape uh, and, and all the gardens operations were as important on the project, and th this was in the Venice Biennale in 2010, I think. And we, 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 we were also flirting literally with the notion of flowers in the models and how to use 3D print and make the 3D prints, a the 3D prints a little bit more dirty and a little bit less precise. And there are all desires at the end of the day to produce unprecise precisions. Uh, uh, again, another of this contradiction, uh, another of this negotiation between words that interests me so much. Um, the last episode, the last four, five or six projects I'm going to show you, are in this category, which is Ritual plus Rough plus Pampas. Um, what happened is a strange thing, um, and I, I really think you cannot separate your own biographical qualities, so you're a mutant of, of yourself. Um, when I became a father and I became 40, for some reason I have a rebirth of my Argentinian root inside me which is a very strange thing because they are, they, I feel very attached to the gauchos and the countryside culture, whatever, which is, I grew up in, in Buenos Aires and Rosario, big cities. I didn't grow up in the middle of the thing, killing cows. But for some reason, I feel really close to that. And I start to look in, the, in those possibilities, and there was this, this thing was very revealing. His name is Francis Malman. He's one of the best, he was the best chef in Argentina, the most sophisticated experimental chef. And at some moment, he, he sold everything in Buenos Aires and Punta Leste, and he, he started to travel over the whole country 
and start to cook in a very old school, the way that the, ca the gauchos will cook that, and then mix it with the most sophisticated way of producing sauces and new mechanisms and techniques of, kitchen, of, 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 of cooking. And I thought that was fascinating, and I start to look in this notion of the ritual, why the ritual start to become highly more specific, how the things start to become and relate to more things that they were much more attached to. So this is all elements from the gauchos from the 19th century. So all these are elements to ride horses or to kill animals. So it's incredibly primitive and brutal what they do, but they're incredibly sophisticated and full of ornaments and so on. So this obsession about the separation between the two elements, it became like a plateau for what I would call is the new families of the species that we were trying to work in the, pro in, in, in the, in the, in the office. So the idea of discrete elements with moments of empathy, instead to produce a total coherency of contradiction, which I would argue most of the previous projects were, this one was much more detached to the idea that it's not about negotiate the whole thing, it's about create enough moments of empathy in which the skin could be completely detached from the structure, and then we can start to rethink in those terms. So Natalie Seruzzi, which originally we were trying to do a house, uh, it became a much more humble project and a bench outside. So out of this chair that we were trying to develop for Bitra called the Rose Chair, we developed this bench, which finally we are fabricating now, and uh, to put in her garden. And again, it was this attempt to try to produce um, what I would call a, a horrific narrative of, the, of incongruous pieces that the effect is a coherent one. And we're trying to do one for a friend of us in Argentina um, with cows in behind. But anyway, um, so start to figure out how to assemble, how to put it together and all that is always part of it. It's something that fascinates me. I tend not to talk too much about it because I, we don't get that many projects and we get to develop when people say, oh, you never think about material, you don't develop that. Well, we didn't have that many projects that we can go that far. So I think that in that sense, I'm very old school architect. We only work in the problems that are, we are confronted with. None of this project I sh I'm showing you is an invention. All of these projects have a client or a competition or a museum, somebody that told us. I cannot think on a project of architecture in an abstract way. Uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing, but it, that's how it works. I believe that that's where architecture exists. It exists, in the, it exists in the friction between the power of what is demanding for you and the capacity to violate that rules and how to overcome that. So the whole rituals and, and meat and cow became really also architectural because I've been struggling for a long time. I've been bothered about the problem of plan and sections and the contemporary role of plan and sections in a computational territory in which everything is produced and thought as a whole. So if you think in the overall and then you just do plans and sections, there are just maps. And in a way, they are like x-rays with the rest of the, the things are operating on MRI. What is interesting about butchery is butchery have the capacity to produce three-dimensional cuts. And the cuts are topological, and they follow the shapes, and they follow the order. So for me, the, the whole notion of butchery was not just um, a way to think uh, as a kind of mechanism of contamination, but it became actually an incredibly precise system to rethink about how to do some of these manipulations of form. Um, I, I apologize that these are videos are from a British butcher, not an Argentinian butcher, uh, but the techniques are slightly different, but it, it, it can go by. So um, part of that is how you negotiate conventional techniques of fabrication. So we, we, we were, we, we've been working for a couple of years. We're developing this series of porcelain lamps for a company in Limoges. This is one for kids. You can, the kids can put in, and this is like a little cow or whatever. Um, and then we, 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 we're doing this chandelier, which already there are two orders, and uh, we try, now we, we're in the process to figure it out, the, the structural weight, because they're incredibly heavy. But what I, what I like about this one, it was a continuity of what we're trying to produce with the chair, which was the notion of incoher incongruence elements that try to produce new coherences, and how that can produce a whole new species of mutants. So it's not really, they're not really mutants, they are like I would call it, uh, they're flesh cyborgs, in the sense of they're very coherent cyborgs, but made out of, they're like Frankensteins, you know? It, it has that kind of a monstrosity. And I think monstrosity is a really interesting way to rethink about that. One thing I will say that the most recent world has, that the oldest world didn't have, it has a sense of familiarity. It has a series of elements that you can recognize as familiar, but they're reconfigured in such a way that that familiarity becomes disturbing which to me is one of the most fundamental rules of monstrosity, and that's what makes monstrosity a much more interesting notion, I would say, 
the mutation for the current state of the world, because mutation always rely in the cell similarity of the previous iteration, which monstrosity allow you the idea that you can put part, different parts together. There is a really interesting, re there is a really interesting diamond of Frankenstein from 1920. Ah, there is a new version coming with Aaron Eckhart, but that they seem less interesting. But uh, you can go all the way to Robert De Niro on how the scars and all that change. But in any case, that's a different story for another day. Um, so this idea, what I was calling fl flesh cyber or flesh mutants, like the work of somebody like Christopher Hoyt, has become, I'm, 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 I'm being very interested in this lately, which is the, the notion of familiarity, you recognize the two bodies, there is something strange going on, so in a way it's disturbing, but it's incredibly familiar. So it's, it's a fundamental difference, I will say, I will not consider this horrific, I will consider this monstrosity, is the notion of familiarity producing disturbing quality, and I think that it, it has also a territorial possibility for, for a playful quality or the day-by-day -day activity, which interests me a lot, how to incorporate that as an agent of transformation. So another version of a lamp that we're working now is called the Edison lamp. And basically the idea is that we will melt a bunch of lamps into one, um, which actually seems like it's gonna work. Um, and then this is the one, this was an attempt that I was trying, I was trying to coert, convince Jeff to push to do the things and we were trying to see if we can do it, in, can I say that, in the Wexner? <laughs> Um, but the idea was to really take the literality to the stream, so I, I was obsessed with the idea, can we meal meat? Can we make a piece of little meat out of meat and then we can plasterize or plastific or, or, or find a way to, pl to put plastic on, on metal or inject it with metal? So we developed a whole series of logics and strategy for it. There was a company actually in Lexington, Kentucky, that were willing to do it, to put the milling machine outside in January. They calculate with a the temperature there will be enough uh, to it because at some moment we're thinking, about, okay, you can put hydrogen into it, but then it will it will screw up the milling machine. So I'm not so sure if we can pull it off in meat, but I'm pretty sure that we can simulate it. We found a store in Los Angeles who does a lot of uh, class B movie prop that they do beautiful plastic meat. Um, and, and, and right now we, we are working in the studio in, with the current studio inside trying to figure out how to rip off the thing. So. Um, this, again, was an experiment. This was really a, f a first series attempt to treat this almost like an art object, meaning this doesn't have any kind of a genetic platform or any kind of horrific uh, new m map for the world to evolve. This was a one-of-a-kind piece, I thought at that time, that it will only try to be what it was. Um, funny enough, then you discover another thing, and if you are smart enough and you look at it, it have a lot of pieces from the Mac already that came back. I don't know if you noticed by now that I have zero capacity to edit things out. Like any version, any new version of the project, it have more stuff. So the way to be for keep evolving is to add in. So okay, we, we did mass, okay, mass. We, oh, now we work ornament, we add ornament. Oh, mutation, mutation. Flesh boons, oh, flesh boons. And we keep adding and adding and adding and it never aband ad abandon. But nevertheless, it always renegotiate the coherency. So even, even though if you don't conceptually abandon each of those pieces, the coherency goes away and, and, and reshape in different format, which fascinates me. Um, this was a mask that we did for a rock band in, in Los Angeles for a video that's coming out in a couple of months. And, and of course, as I was saying, we thought it was one of a kind, but then the, well, the, the I'm not gonna show you another animation there. Uh, that doesn't even work, so I don't know if I can. Oh, it's there. So actually we took literally the same flesh thing and we made it out of super high-end porcelain for a sculpture commission from the Ritz Carlton in Miami. Um, because they give us like again one of the things, oh, you can you give us an idea in 72 hours? Uh, I said, sure, let's take the meat piece, and put the, change the material, put in taller legs, and we call it a day. Um, it may happen, it may not, um, but I, then I became fascinated the dialogue, the possibility that you can have the same piece done in this rotten material and the other one done in super more high material and kind of a, produce some kind of a conversation. So even though these are pieces, you can see the way that we represent and we talk about them. We are architects, we figure out how you put it together, how you will assembly, so on and so forth. Um, last part, how are we doing with the time? We are okay, right? Okay. It's exactly 55 minutes. I'm gonna be done in one, one hour and four minutes. This is a project that is gonna start 
is going to start construction in April. I cannot tell you what the name of the company is. I can tell you it's a big airplanes company. There are only two in the world. There's only one in America. So you can figure out which one is. Uh, it's a customer experience center. Uh, it's basically only for the CEO of the big airplane companies to come for two or three days to make decisions of billions of dollars in planes. So we call it uh, information spa. It's an, interior, it's an interior operation only. It's literally just a ceiling and that command center and, and some floor behaviors. It's by, any mean, it's by no means is not the most radical project that we did, but for me it was an interesting operation to work because what my goal in this project was to don't get fired. Uh, but not just because I really wanted to figure it out how to work with a big client, with a big corporation, and figure it out if what we produce can be negotiated in such a way that it allows us to keep a lot of the edges that we're interested in produce and be able also to understand what were the mechanisms that come in that conversation. So, and, and I will say that a lot of things we managed to, to convey and to produce. So it's a ceiling, a couple of walls, and then they get us, they led us to all these little robots, which is fascinating, we, uh, because also we're producing all the content for the screens, so the project goes beyond the architecture operation. So we, we, we are working in collaboration with Alex McDowell, and right now we just finished the contraction documents that unfortunately at that I cannot show you. Um, but the idea is some of these robots, when you walk, they have, have a whole triggers and sensor that will follow you, and they reconfigure what they show as, as you move by. So it has a lot of amazing technology involved that it has been super interesting to work. Now the project probably belongs as, as an species, as a genre, it belongs much more to the work that probably was, we were doing three or four years ago uh, than the work that we're doing right now. But nevertheless, there's always something in your head about those things because sometimes it's good to back and revisit some of those ideas and see if you can build them. And in this case, we, we had a chance it's gonna be built. So uh, uh, the ceiling is, uh, uh, as I show you, is, is the most complex piece, is the main piece. But there's a lot of other little guys here and there that I think is gonna be interesting. So um, in parallel to that, we are back with Alessi one, one more time to see if we can get it off the ground. In this case, we're doing a series of espresso coffee cups. Um, we just did, which believe it or not, this is one of the most profitable things we've ever done in our lives. It's a remote control for GP Morgan, private banking investment company in Los Angeles. They have remote control in the meeting rooms to call people to bring them coffee and water. And um, we did one for them, and now they're doing 20 for the whole US, and we sell them, each of them, one as an art piece. So we did it as a product, we did an art piece. So actually, uh, it's very sad to say, at the end of the road, we're going to make m as much money of this guy, of the project, and the, the money that we do. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Can we take it off of the, the video? Uh, it's, it's kind of sad, but that's, that's the reality. We did this literally, I swear to God, we did it on a Monday, 5 p.m. to a Wednesday, 10 a.m. But anyway, that's the thing. It's made out of silicon. We painted, and that's in their GP Morgan offices. Uh, which, in a strange way, that little guy became the genesis for this big guy. Uh, it was a competition for the National Library in Helsinki, which it was one of the few times in my life that I get, I became delusional and tricked myself that we have a shot at it. <laughs> um, because what happened was we did a competition, they did an exhibition, and they have a popular boat. And we were in the top three of the popular boat in Helsinki. It wasn't the winter, so people are a little bit screw up in Helsinki in, in winter. And if you, some of you know Kiwi, you, you know what I mean. Um, but Anyway, I really, uh, to me, this was, uh, it, 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 I consider, it, it's one of the few projects I still, after a while that we've done it, I like it, but also it became in many ways the plateau for a whole series of new ideas. Because this, the notion of contradictory arguments that they were more of genetic cause, filled with information, than when you produce it transform, in this one became a much more literal thing. Because what I mean by that is, it was, th there was a lot of restrictions, so there was no way to avoid that this thing would be a box. So I was fascinated with the, okay, we're gonna work with the box and we're gonna do, we're gonna do a box with all these gigantic pimples. And unlike what people thought with the program, 
the library is not in the box. The library is in all these little guys, and these guys is a public park for window. So you can do all the activities of a park inside. And so to me, this project became an important one because it was the one, that the first one that we took this idea of contradictory arguments and making it into a literal formal language and how those things can start to negotiate. And it was the first time I figured out a way how to deal with the problem of the box. And in, in a strange way, that became something um, which I would say is triggering most of the world that we're working right now, not because of the box, but this idea of the literality of the contradiction between, not the contradiction, but assuming that the distinction between two formal languages or two different kinds of geometry, it doesn't matter anymore because they're all, at the end of the day, are images. And because they're all images, at the end of the day, they're all pixelated. If they're all pixelations, at the end of the day, they are all forms of coherency, no matter what you do. So that is kind of a very liberating. And that also produced incredibly bad things, like this competition that we did for Taichung, which is horrendous. But sometimes the most horrendous project, you learn a lot. And this, I mean, I really don't like what we did here. And also you can see that we're trying to do a sky, some trees, and all those things. And you don't win in competition because you put sky, blue skies and trees. Wolf Briggs lied to me. He said to me that whoever has the most blue sky wins. Not true. It's not true. Uh, anyway, it's an horrendous project, but conceptual was very, very useful because it really would start to work with the corroding and the three-dimensional butcher cut in a literal way. Um, right now, we're working in a pedestrian bridge in Barcelona that it looks like it's going to get built. It's not none of this version, but these were the two versions that we present to the city. Uh, it's by far the most interesting client that we ever had because we have this version which we thought it was much more complex to get away. It was like it's, an it's, like, it's like a series of archipelagos, it's a pedestrian bridge. And we show, uh, we didn't show that, we show first this other version, which was a much more straight one with a rotational module. Um, but the funny thing is they say, we like the other one better. And so we are working right now in a version and trying to negotiate both of them. This was a metal, and now we're trying to change it. It's going to be in, in laminated bamboo. This, the whole structure is going to be in wood. So the, pro the bridge is going to have a lot of mobility, and we, we are working with the engineers. And at the end of the month, I cannot show you the, the newest version because we are in the middle of it working, but it, it's, it's actually way more aggressive, way more interesting than these ones. Um, but this one seems we're going to get it built, and, and if, if we get it built, it's, it's going to be pretty amazing. It's one of the cities that, uh, for obvious reasons, my, my, my hero Mirage, so I would really love if we can build a, a, a bridge in Barcelona. The, the last two projects I'm, I want to show you are um, two of my favorite projects in a way. This is the one for one we, we, we won the, which has won the PA award. Uh, is the current version of the Thyssen Bornavisa. And it takes the literality of the meat and the cow to a whole other level. Um, so actually the project is way, way more simpler than it looks. Uh, the project is only that thing as in space. The rest all is like a massive a sculptural installation that tried to conquer as much territory, which is, an, is a neat trick that I learned long time about long time ago from Enrique. Mirage's people used to think that his work imitated nature it was the other way around. It was the artificiality and a stretch the geometry artificiality as much as you can so you make you conquer over the nature. So it was art it, make, it was making artificial, art, uh, it was to produce artificiality into nature. And we use a similar trick. So the project itself is fairly small. It's only um, 6,000 square feet of the space. The rest is all expansion of the things. Um, because we're trying to convince Francesca that at least we should start with installations for the town. So it's in the middle of the south. And in this one, th there was this really obsession to the incompleteness and to go back to this notion of, of, of the disturbing familiarity and, and new possibility for the horrific beauty. Um, so uh, let's see how it goes. And for some reason, the animation has slowed down in this part. Um, but so we were interested in, in, in playing around with the whole gaucho motif and the castle. But there was something about what I would call it some um, it's not only the rituals and the pampa and the romantic, but I would say there is some kind of um, surreal quality in, 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 and, and the desire in making the images in that way and making it much more dirty 
And we never intend them, the, the images to become real. We try to do it like almost this kind of a picturesque uh, and pastoral things, but they were incredibly artificial. Uh, I'm not so sure if this is the right way to go, but I was interested with the flow with uh, another agency of dirtiness into the project. And this one is probably too much of the stream, and, 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 and if, we, we, if we work in a new version, probably some of these things will go away. But the negotiation between the Helsinki and Taichun, and this, it, it came, the, the last project I want to show you, which is a competition that we just did a couple of months ago for the National Theater in Bogota, Colombia, uh, which kind of uh, tried to articulate that, the, the notion of the monstrosity, but also it was a lot of constraints, so there was a lot of boxes, maximization of the site that you needed to do, um, that I found it a, a, as a super compelling problem. So in this case, I, I would argue that this one is probably the one that comes close, close to the notion of, of, of monstrosity. And because basically, and also the notion of carbon and butchery. So butchery right now is becoming kind of a, the guiding principle to which one we are trying to operate. So the assumption that it's a pre-established conditions of bodies and masses that can be carved and re-articulated and reassembled. And of course, there's certain motif and certain aesthetic effects that come from previous projects that always, that it never goes away. Um, because as I said, we work with family, but also I, I, I'm very interested in what I call the genetic memory of a formal language. I, I don't think you can produce a sophisticated formal language that doesn't convey a sense of, a, sense of uh, a, a genealogy within itself. And that's, that's what I, I like. I mean, those are the architects that I admire. Those are the artists that I like. The one that they have that sense of coherency, that probably that, that, that was what Jeff was referring in, into his very generous introduction. But I really think that um, at the end of the day, it, it's not something that you kind of premeditate or, or, or predetermine. At the end of the day, is the way that your brain is, the way your brain is wired, is, is the way that, what, what are the obsessions that motivate? So for me, the horrific, the grotesque, the mutation, all these things are obsessions, are mechanisms of obsession, and, and I don't conceive the work in any other way than being driven by obsessions. And, and at the end of the day, also, you'll see it. Um, so I don't see the work of a strange. I mean, I see the work as how it's supposed to be. And I cannot think that the project should be any other way than what it is. Um, so that thing says, gracias por su something. So um, we, 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 we're coming to an end. And so some of these projects are in the exhibition, so you will have the chance to look them more carefully and destroy them even more. Um, this but is a support. I want to I wanna finish with a clip that I like it for many reasons. I mean, David Finch is one of my, my favorite filmmakers. But I always think that this is a, like a, the, most, the, the only thing I can come close to a manifesto at any given time about the now of, on the life of an architect. This was a support. I really okay. Trust me. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> Trust me, everything's going to be fine. You have to tell that to your client. And you always have to think to yourself. They always have to meet you in a very strange time of your life. Thank you. Sure. It changed over time, you know, like, uh, uh, okay, the question is um, how much I incorporate different techniques and technology of different softwares and into the work. Um, 
it changed over time. Uh, until PS1, I was still modeling most of the work myself. After that, and lately, I don't almost model anything myself. I still do all the, all the renders, animations, still I do it myself. But meaning the, the system became more open and more interchangeable. And I honestly think we are right now in, in a phase of multi-platform. So I don't know. The early work, I would say probably in 2008, 2009, it was 100% animation software, Maya. Now we are ma we make it much more multiple platforms, and from ZBrush to coding to uh, Real Flows to um, Rhino. I mean, it has become a much more closed platform. So I'm I'm fairly open. I'm not really religious about it. Um, that's what I'm thinking. I think myself more as a designer now. I'm I'm completely embedded with computers. Uh, but not because it's a technological geek thing, it's because I think it expands the possibility in a whole different level, and I think it, 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 it brings, unlike what most people think, for me it brings a very interesting sense of unpredictability. So we, tr we experiment with them, some of them are more successful, some of them are less. We, we experiment early on with scripting, I didn't find it so appealing, I, f I find it incredible, I'm, I'm very impatient, so the scripting takes too long and usually uh, just, just move the CD, you know. Um, so, but I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in any kind of possible, so it depends on it. I mean, lately, I mean, a lot of the latest stuff, there's a lot of ZBrush into it, which I find it pretty compelling, uh, a little bit dangerous too. Um, but to me, at the end of the day, is how you develop a strategy for to create virtuosities around that, and how you develop a control of it. Um, so, I'm, I'm pretty much open to all of them, but I, I, I said this sometimes to the students the other day, and I always said, I, I think it's, Technology is super interesting and fascinating, and but you have to be married with your with the design ambition, right? I mean, uh, I always use the same example: I, I, Jimi Hendrix, which only the people with white hair will know what I'm talking about. But Jimi Hendrix was a very important guitar player in the 60s. Um, and if you think in, in, in Boodle Child or, or any of the sounds with the with the bang, bang, the, the, the wawa pedal, you need the electric guitar and you need the wawa pedal, right? He can you cannot do that with a classical guitar; it doesn't sound the same. But you can have an electric guitar while pedal, and you're not Jimi Hendrix. I mean, you have to have, it, it, it all have to align. So I'm a strong believer in that. So I'm super interested in what other technology is available. But by now, I know exactly what I want to do. And I'm, I'm less at the mercy of the technology than, uh, that I was five years ago, let's say. Because also because technology has become much easier. I mean, the, the moment that my mom can use an iPhone, I mean, it's not that cool anymore, technology. You know what I mean? Like uh, technology has a lot of interesting things, a lot of problematic things, and it uh, requires a different logic to read. That's why I'm arguing for virtuosity, because I think when I was a student in Argentina and we used to draw by hand, if you were a good one, you, you were way better than the bad ones. There was a huge difference. Computer levels that. I mean, you still can look, but it, it requires different reading. What is so? I don't know. I mean, it seems like. Um, I try to be not dogmatic about it. I'm dogmatic about the notion of technology and dogmatic about the now, but what are all the possibilities within that? No, I'm not. No. You want me to elaborate? Um, no, because it, they're different mediums. Uh, look, if you look at the original uh, La Tourette model, was made out of basswood, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. It was bas or some kind of wood, whatever it was, the, what the French did to wood at that time. And then La Tourette was not built out of wood. You know what I mean? Like, it has been always like that. If you look at the drawings of Palladio, I think the drawings of Palladio were better than the buildings of Palladio. But not where, but they're different. And I think that's fine. That's part of it. I mean, uh, I have no problem with that. I, I, I'm completely, um, I'm completely aware of that, and I'm, I'm, I'm in peace with that. I have no problem with that. It's, you cannot avoid it. I mean, it, it's, the it's the nature of the game. Um, but no, no worry. First of all, let me build a couple of them, then I will tell you how worried I was. <laughs> it, it, it's not really that, uh, that much of experience because usually I've been thinking museums and so on. They're all pristine and perfect. Anybody goes every day and clean it. Nobody will do any building. But um, I don't know. I mean, today I, I'm not worried. 
Uh, when I build one, I will call me and I'll tell you. Yes. You know, it's a strange. I, I, I mentioned that um, I'm really old school architect in the sense that I work in whatever people ask me to work on it. So I, I never have like a plan. Oh, I wanna now I wanna do video games. I want somebody come and say, Hey, you're gonna work with us in a video game? Sure. Uh, no, I'm serious about. It. I don't have. Um, that's the beauty to be involved in a place like Sayak or a school like this. Y you have the schools and other places to develop those things and figure out what is possible and wh what is next and so on. But in the office, I'm very much driven for what the people ask us to do. Now we want to we wanna be working in a movie soon, and I'm looking forward to it, but uh, not particularly different than working any other thing. No, I'm, I don't know. I mean, somebody was asking today uh, about social media all that. I don't know. I don't have Facebook account. I, I don't tweet. I don't have Twitter. I'm actually, I, this is going to sound bad. I, f I consider it fairly idiotic. Um, I think Twitter brain fart, and, and I don't know. I, I, I don't find it appealing, and, and I, but I know I'm wrong. I, I know it's incredibly appealing, and there's a huge potential there, but you, I'm not. So I, I don't know. There's certain minions. I don't know. Architecture is very slow. It's, it's like a big elephant, you know. So, and that to me is what is so charming about architecture, because it's the thing that doesn't go away. You know what I mean? Like ten years from now, this auditorium, a group of other people, they will have I don't know iPhone in, in, inside your eyes or whatever it will be at that time. <laughs> But this thing is going to be pretty much the same. And that is a bad thing, but also it's a cool thing. So I don't know. I mean, whatever, whatever people ask us to work on it.